to go ahead and share and share my screen real quick. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you to Kelly. Thank you to the, the Royersford Public Library for having me this evening. Um, I was really, really excited um, because I was able to achieve rock star status for my four-year-old son because the Royersford Public Library is one of our local libraries that um, he often attends. Uh, and I've done a, a bunch of these now and they've always been in places that he's probably never been to. Um, so he thought it was really, really cool that I was talking um, to you all this evening. So thank you all so much for having me. My name is Neil Hobbins. I am the Historic Site Supervisor here at Potts Grove Manor up in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. We are located just off of Route 100 on King Street. Pretty much if you come up from Rorysford, you take 100 up to, or take 422 up to Route 100, head towards Allentown. And we are the second right-hand turn, um, the first one will put you down on the high street, which is in front of the house, um, but the second turn will take you on the King Street, and we are right there. Uh, King Street is currently closed for the most part, but you can still come down and access uh, Potts Grove Manor. We'd love to see you. Potts Grove Manor is owned and operated by the County of Montgomery. We are part of their parks, Division of Parks, Trails, and Historic Sites um, for the county. So tonight, um, I figured I'd start here with a story. Um, you know, really any good historian should tell you and should be really good at telling stories. Um, and sometimes those stories are really, really interesting. Sometimes they um, can be a little bit more interesting. And hopefully tonight, I'll hopefully take our story here at Pottsgrove Manor and bring it a little bit closer and, and relatable um, to you all here. So that if you've been here before, maybe you might learn something new. Uh, we just went on a very long journey a few years ago, um, just prior to COVID, where we kind of took a break. It's really good as um, you know, practicing historians to um, dive back into research every couple of years. Uh, technology changes. That's something we've all really realized over in the last year, how much technology has changed and, and what you can learn from recent technology that's really grown. So we decided to take a break. Um, it started in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, we decided not to host a formal exhibit and instead kind of dive back into research. And uh, in order to keep us on track, because the other aspect of being a historian is once you get down a rabbit hole, you can never maybe make it back out again. So to kind of keep us on track, we started with a big question was, who is John Potts? And that question wasn't necessarily to label kind of the titles that you're going to hear tonight about being an iron master, being a merchant, uh, but it was who made the man? What was the man? What was the father? What was the husband that was John Potts? And kind of create, um, essentially, we're looking for kind of like a uh, verbal hologram of who this man was. But my story doesn't start there. It starts with, you never know what you're going to find in research. Um, and I start with, this year, uh, one of our great tools that we use is all of our different primary sources here at the house. Uh, we have uh, ledgers and forge books and store books, um, all dating to the 1750s, 1760s of the Potts Valley time. And as a material culture historian for me, something kept sticking out that I just couldn't really figure out. And that's uh, what's highlighted here. Uh, what it says is uh, green nap 48 yards, and what it's referring to is a wool from the 18th century. This is green nap wool uh, in the color green and nap is kind of essentially um, a lower end style of wool, which doesn't make sense for a couple of different things. Number one, 48 yards is a whole lot of yards for um, any wool fabric in the 18th century for even just a family like ours. Um, 48 yards could roughly make somewhere around um, six to seven men's suits of clothes during the time. Um, and why would a family of our class and our structure uh, necessarily be purchasing uh, nap-based wool, which was a lower quality style of wool at the time? And this really bugged me. Um, I couldn't answer it. This is just one of many, many entries. Um, you see them as high as 78 yards, as low as 20 yards, and it happens all the time. And eventually uh, I just had to walk away from it and just move on. Uh, a few weeks later, we were going through another resource of us, which is our uh, runaway ads uh, from our indentured servants in this case. And uh, you'll notice right away, and it took me four times reading this for the aha light moment to come on, the highlighted areas, 
say had on a green nap jacket, had on a green nap jacket. And at the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of these stories that I'm going to share with you today, um, they, it takes a while to get to where we are. We're still trying to figure everything out. We're still trying to learn even more. Uh, we're in the process of still kind of uncovering some of these stories. But for years and years and years in the house, we were always told that the livery of the household, which is essentially the uniforms that the servants and enslaved persons wore here, consisted of the colors uh, blue and red, which never really made sense. Um, blue and red were the outside, the blue color really didn't have anything to do with the Potts family, um, but it was kind of made like science, like this is what it is. Um, and what we're finding out now is that it was actually a much simpler than that. It was green. Um, green was kind of the color, not all the servants, not all of the enslaved persons, but essentially if they received some type of clothing, clothing inventory, a lot of the males at least were wearing uh, green nap jackets. Um, so, you know, no matter how long you've been doing this, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how much you think you've learned, there's always something new to uncover and to learn. So how do we tell our story here at Potts Grove Manor? And uh, this is what we used to think we were, uh, you know, prior to March 13th, 2020. Everything that you see here was a big part. This is a lot of the behind the scenes that you don't get to necessarily see um, on a daily basis uh, between cleaning the house, which is a uh, relatively frequent thing. A lot of times um, our curator will tell you, that's Amy there working on the clock. Um, she'll tell you that she's just a glorified house cleaner because um, it's true um, as a museum, we do a lot of house cleaning um, constantly, especially now with all the gnats and bugs that are coming out because of summer. Um, there's a lot of upkeep that takes to go in the house, a lot of projects. Um, last year, we added a bake oven that you see down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen as well as a couple of years ago, we put in a true 18th century kitchen garden on the site um, to replicate what an, an English kitchen garden would look like. And then of course that research that I was talking about. And for you, um, many of you sitting at home, you don't get to see this aspect of our lives, but we tell you about this kind of through this aspect of our lives. And that's the different programming, the daily tours that we give um, and you know, new to us since March of, 13th of 2020 is a lot of virtual programming. Um, if you haven't visited us on Facebook yet, um, please do. There's probably roughly over 40 videos that we've um, either done live or produced um, since March of 2020 on all types of topics. Um, early on, it was more or less to get us out of our houses um, and get us into a different location. Um, but later on, we really got into kind of the nitty gritty um, and focused on a lot of different cool little POTS stories, a lot of um, POTS family members, things like that. Uh, we also are, um, since I put this up here, we've held our Colonial Mayfair this past May, which was our first large event um, since the beginning of the pandemic started. So we're very happy um, to have people back in the house again, um, especially as a larger program, and continue telling the stories um, that you know, of what we're learning behind the scenes and dealing with behind the scenes. So how does our story start? So um, our home, Potts Grove Manor, was built by John Potts. And that's a big reason on why the house is still here today. John Potts, um, as many of you know, is the founder of Potts Town. Uh, and that's really why his house was saved. But that's not crediting everything that John did. And if John was alive today, he would definitely be Kind of the who's who of our area, um, definitely you know one of the wealthier um, kind of you know upper class um, people of society who really were kind of the movers and shakers of what was going on. And um, our story story starts with his father Thomas, who immigrated from Wales in 1698, and he settled in Germantown early on. Now today, Germantown is a part of Philadelphia, but back in the 18th early 18th century. It, Germantown was its own separate community. And Thomas really had a kind of an interesting start here in the colony. But really, John is going to be born in 1710, but it's the 17 teens that are going to change the life of the Potts family. And for two reasons. The first one being that uh, Thomas's wife, John's mother, passed away. And when she passed away, Thomas is going to quickly remarry. And when he remarries, he remarries um, a family that was from what they called was the Manitoni region. Um, in the 18th century. Today, we would call that area Boyertown, Pottstown, kind of this area where the Manitoni Creek is flowing through. Um, but that's going to be major for him because it kind of changes his worldview a little bit, where he kind of immigrates here, settles in Germantown, and really has a rough beginning. Um, this allows him to kind of open up and travel a little bit farther from where he kind of established his home. The big other second part, and probably the more 
important aspect of our story is that the iron industry was founded here in Pennsylvania at the same exact time. Um, Pennsylvania was late to the iron game. They're one of the last colonies to establish iron production here in the colony. Um, but what separates Pennsylvania from many of the other colonies is how rich it is and the resources needed for the iron industry. So Thomas Rudder and Samuel Savage are really the founders of the iron industry here in Pennsylvania. We will include Samuel Nutt. Um, so everybody, you know, hopefully in this area lives pretty close to Nutt Road. Um, but it is named for Samuel Nutt and Coventry is just, you know, really right across the river from Royersford. Um, so we will include Samuel Nutt, but the biggest thing that um, Samuel Nutt lacks that Savage and Rudder have is capital. Um, so Nutt's a little bit late to the game each time because he needs to find a business partner um, to help support um, his endeavors into the iron industry. So Rudder and Savage has established the iron industry. By 1720, they had created the Colebrook Dale, which was the first cold blast furnace here in Pennsylvania. Um, it's in present day, just outside present day Boyertown. And we see Thomas get involved. Um, Thomas quickly grows his shares through the 1720s. By 1730, he's a full share owner in the Colebrook Dale. And that's really how John is gonna gain kind of all his knowledge in the iron industry. But really John's wealth, what's gonna make John the man that he is, uh, comes through um, arguably one of the most important things that uh, a man can do, and that's get married. He gets married and he gets married to somebody who's very rich. Um, Ruth Savage is who he marries in 1734, but Ruth's full name is Ruth Rudder Nut Savage. She's a direct uh, descendant of all three main iron families. And that's really where a lot of the wealth that John is gonna acquire comes from. She's essentially the princess of iron. Um, so they settled, they're given Pompa Dickin, which is the Iron Master's house at the Colebrookdale, and they live there until the late 1740s when their family's beginning to grow, as well as all of John's business adventures are moving away from the Colebrookdale region. And that brings us to here. Oh, sorry. I got talking, I forgot what I was doing. There's Colebrookdale. Yeah. So you are all sitting right about in here. So we can see Coventry, Limerick, we're right in here, Parker Ford area. That's the marriage certificate. And it's John and Ruth's name right here. They were married into the Quaker faith, even though um, they weren't necessarily um, fully practicing Quakers. Um, they, they kind of, we didn't, we don't really see them really attending meetings or anything like that, uh, but they do get married in the Quaker faith. And this is where we come to. So this is essentially the land that John is gonna purchase here in uh, what is now uh, Pottstown, West Potts Grove, um, that side area. And we are that tiny little red speck in the middle there. So we are only four acres today. But in 1750, two tracts of land are gonna come up for sale, totaling 995 acres. John purchases them. John knew what was here. Um, he helped divide this land here equally amongst the McCall family that was living here and who he had purchased the land from. Um, so he knew exactly what was here. It was rich in resources. It was rich in, it had a major road uh, running through it. Um, today, that road connects us from Reading and Philadelphia. They called it the Great Road. We call it High Street or Ridge Pike. Um, so there was a lot going on here. Uh, so he initially purchases 995 acres and then he quickly begins to add on. Everything that you see is pretty much um, all of John's original acreage that you're gonna see um, during the 18th century. Um, but like I said, we are that tiny little speck on the map now that is the house and the four acres that we now own. And what I'm gonna do now is change up my screen. I'm gonna take you inside the house here. So welcome to the front door of Pottsgrove Manor. Um, if this was the 18th century, you have come up off of High Street. Your carriage would have come along um, a pretty muddy and uh, very uneven road uh, that is now High Street and come up through some formal gardens to the front door of the house where you've been greeted by a servant or an enslaved person of the household. And immediately we enter into the Great Hall here. And the Great Hall 
is really kind of a greeting area. It's an all purpose room um, for the Potts family. During the winter months, there could have been um, some functions held here. It is one of the larger rooms, but it's gonna be the most formal room in the household because it's your first impression of the Potts family and the wealth that the Potts family had. Um, as well as for a lot of people coming, if they were uninvited, this would really be the only room they would spend any type of time in. Um, so this is our great hall. A little bit about the household and the architecture of the household. It is a true Georgian style mansion. Um, the Georgian time period was a time of balance. So you'll see balance in everything that we do, not only in the rooms, it's uh, four, four, four by four on each floor, but also in the decoration that you can see kind of that we set up, everything is balanced even on the table. So the Georgian time period was a big time of balance. Um, it's also a time of Greek and Roman revival architecture. So you see a lot of columns and scrolls in the woodwork um, as you go in. The first floor boards of the house are not original. They spent a long time as a hotel and bar. So you can only imagine what those floorboards look like. Um, but the stairs, the second floor and the third floor are, and I'll make sure you take a little peek of them as we go throughout our tour here today. The woodwork that you see, the majority of it is original to, a pot, to the Potts house. Uh, what isn't original has been replaced by another Potts house called Laura Lodge, which we have in our collection. Um, it sits in a, um, a climatized storage on our property here. What's really interesting is all the Potts houses had uh, identical woodwork in them, uh, which is really, really neat. So if you've ever been to General Washington's headquarters of Valley Forge, that is a Potts house. That's the Isaac Potts house, and it's a miniature Potts for a family at the end of the day. Um, so this is where we also begin to introduce a little bit more of the family. So John and Ruth get married and they settle at the Colebrookdale. By the time they move here at Pottsford Manor, they have 10 children. Three more are gonna be born in the house, totaling 13 children total, nine boys and four girls. All of the children are gonna be formally educated. And we're gonna use this clock here um, to tell the story of the children. Um, so both boys and girls were formally educated. This clock was owned by John Jr who is one of the 13 children. Um, the Potts family love the same names. It is one of the biggest headaches that we have as historians of the Potts family is that they use the same names over and over again. Um, so 13 children, um, they are, a lot of them are named to names of uncles and aunts. And um, so it's, it gets pretty difficult. So the name doesn't really matter, um, but the stories do. So this clock, was owned by John Jr., who was um, kind of an upper middle child of the 13 children. The children were formally educated. Uh, the boys, we believe, early on went to the effort of Cloister. Um, there was a boarding school for, for young boys at the effort of Cloister. And uh, the girls, early on, we believe, went to Lidditz. Uh, but we begin to see that change in 1752. And the reason behind that is that the Philadelphia Academy is opened uh, in Philadelphia. And the Philadelphia Academy was established by Ben Franklin. Um, it consisted of three schools. It was the boarding school for boys. It was the poor school um, for children who did not have the means to be able to pay to go to boarding school. Pennsylvania offered um, kind of uh, equality really isn't the word, but an Equal Education Act was passed in 1683 that all children in the Pennsylvania colony had the right to uh, read and write. Uh, so there was a poor school established there, as well as the college, which today the University of Pennsylvania uh, traces their foundation on the Philadelphia Academy. So we see the boys go there. And at that time, we believe that the girls went to Quaker boarding school in Philadelphia. Um, it is not mentioned at any ledgers, the name of their school. Um, so we're not exactly sure which one. But there wasn't ever 13 children running around this household. There was 25 years between the oldest, who was Tommy or Thomas, and the youngest, who is uh, Ruth Jr. or Ruthie, um, as she was referred to in the 18th century. Um, so 25 years between the oldest and the youngest, as well as uh, boarding school, typically uh, kind of mid-adolescence, uh, anywhere between eight, nine years old, they were shipped off to boarding school. Um, so there was only children in this house for a relatively short amount of time. We do see them being cared for by a nanny, as well as a wet nurse um, early on. Typically they were under the care of the nanny until there was either space that opened up or also um, they would go through um, potty training and then come down into the main household where they received two tutors each day um, throughout their time while living here at Potts Grove Manor. Um, so that's our children. And now we're gonna move into the front parlor here. 
you guys don't get kind of the ooh and all ah of this. I gave this, um, I gave one of these presentations on a very cold night in January um, at probably about seven o'clock at night, so it was dark. And we moved into this room and I can just see everybody's face be like, because this was filmed in August of 2018. And um, it, you could just kind of feel the heat and the joy kind of coming through, but we're back in that time again. Um, but this is gonna be, the two front parlors are gonna be the uh, lighter rooms of the house. The house doesn't sit perfect north, south, east, or west. John positioned it so that the sun rises um, on one corner of the household, passes across the front of the household, and uh, sets on the opposite corner of the household. And that was to make sure that all the light was seen in all the front rooms um, as much as possible throughout the day, um, and also into the evening. Um, I'm in the back of the house, so the, this is the darker portion of the house. Um, in the 18th century, as well as during the winter, it would keep the sunlight and help warm the rooms in the front of the household here. This was uh, the more formal parlor for the family. This is also where we begin to talk about John. So when John purchased this house in 1752, he purchased this really as a retirement home. Um, by 1752, he had begun to kind of progress outside of just being an iron master. He got involved uh, as the justice of the peace for a number of years, as well as he began really expanding merchant businesses that he had in Philadelphia. And because of this, John doesn't spend a whole lot of time here at Potts Grove Manor. He's mostly spending all this time in Philadelphia at his residence in Philadelphia, overseeing his two mer merchant businesses, or he's traveling from all the different forges and, for for forges and furnaces that he owns within the area. So really he's not around a lot, which is really, really hard for us to understand kind of John is a father figure. And John is the father figure. Really what he's doing is he's providing for his children in the way that he was expected, which was monetarily. He was providing them the ability to go to school, to be raised um, you know, in well-known, well-established schools and get the best education. Um, even the girls were expected to have a very good education and begin to um, learn the duties of running a large manor house um, as the lady of the household also. Um, they were also given plenty of clothing and very high-end clothing. Um, they definitely did not go for want at all. Um, one of the daughters, Patty, loves hats. She buys hats all the time. Um, so he made sure that uh, they were being provided for on that aspect. The other app, really interesting um, kind of father figure aspect that's really hard for us to understand is that during his life, while he was alive, he did not give his children anything. They had to purchase everything from him. So as his older boys get involved into the iron industry, we see John charging them um, to be able to purchase from him um, these different iron forges and furnaces and establish that way. Um, so he definitely you know, was not giving his children anything. But what's really also interesting is we, at the end of John's life, um, John becomes sick in 1767 and does live here at Potsgrove in, the, in the, that last part of his life. Um, he immediately sits down and writes his will. And that's really where we kind of get to see um, the heart of the man per se. Um, and what we see is that number one, he takes um, the extreme amount of wealth that he had and he evenly distributed it between all 13 children. Um, the, the adolescent children who were still um, in school it was essentially put into the estate to accrue interest um, while they were still adolescents. Um, they were not to be given it till, until 1779, about 11 years after his death. Um, the other ones who were grown up um, and considered um, kind of moving on with life, um, the, the daughters, it was given to their husbands um, or the males, it was given to them themselves. But what's also really interesting is even though he equally distributes it, he then turns around and takes money from two children, um, John Jr., who owned a clock, as well as Jonathan, um, who's my favorite Potts child, um, who was a doctor. And he, he took money from them because of the um, added expense of their education. Um, so because they went on to higher education than the other children, he took money away from them, uh, mainly because he flipped the bill in both of their schoolings. Um, in fact, Jonathan became a doctor because his father was able to provide for him in that case. And then he gave it to two other children. Um, he gave it to his oldest, Thomas, and not because Thomas was the oldest. In fact, he had skipped over Thomas as the executor of his account and made his second son, Samuel, his executor. Um, but he gave Thomas more money because he felt that he kind of pushed Thomas into a little bit of a bad business deal uh, with Thomas York. 
Um, so he gave him a little bit of extra money for that, um, as well as another child um, was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was kicked in the head when he was young. Um, so they gave him a little bit more money also and as well. And so we do see this kind of really interesting aspect to John, uh, who John the man is as a father, um, as a husband. You can tell he was madly deeply in love with his wife, Ruth. Um, he provided for her at any, any account. Um, and he uh, just provided for her both in life and in death. Um, she was given a large sum of money per year for the rest of her life at following his death. He gave her a house with large um, ground in Pottstown on the corner of High and Hanover, um, where the pizza place, and if you're familiar with Pottstown, um, that corner lot uh, was her lot that she was allowed to live on. We're gonna go ahead and enter into our next parlor here. And this is another front parlor. Typically we had this set as a dining parlor for the 18th century um, because it's off of our kitchen. Um, but in here, we're gonna talk a little bit about Ruth, uh, John's wife. And so John's wife, Ruth, uh, was definitely not living a life of leisure. Um, for the majority of our guests who come in here, um, a lot of us, the easiest way for us to wrap our minds around manor houses is a lot of times we connect it into Downton Abbey. Uh, which was pretty pretty popular here in the United States for a long period of time. Um, and even though there are a few similarities between the two, um, it's mostly differences. And one of the biggest differences is the lady of the household is definitely not living a life of leisure here at Pottsboro Manor. She is living a life of purpose. Um, essentially, we call her <coughs> the manager of the household here. Um, so she's running everything. She is here on a daily basis uh, while John is away. She's overseeing all the servants and enslaved persons and the jobs that they're doing on a daily basis. She's making menus for the household. She's in charge of all the major purchasing. Um, so she is really hustling and bustling here. And like I said, she loved to purchase stuff. She loved furniture. Um, she purchased a lot of furniture. Uh, a secret note that we don't really kind of let out the bag too much. She puts John in debt in the year that they move in here, um, just a little bit, um, because of all of her major purchasing for the household here. Um, so she did love high society. Outside of kind of managing the household here, her other job is to oversee the wealth um, and how that wealth is looked upon by people outside of the Potts family. So she's hosting, um, you know, dinners and parties here at Potts River Manor um, and continuing kind of the wealth that we have here um, that we show off. But this is our dining parlor. This is always my favorite room. Um, it's just always bright and cheery, um, and we're very excited to be able to kind of get the tables back out and set it back up again. From here, we're going to head into the kitchen. Um, first thing first, this is not the actual Potts kitchen. The Potts kitchen was torn down in the early 1800s by a gentleman by the name of Daniel Hittner. Um, if Daniel Hittner was alive today, he have a show on HGTV called Flip My Manor House. Um, he was known to update these English um, and, and German um, <clears throat> Georgian manor houses um, for the times in the early 1800s. Um, the biggest thing he did here was connect the two sides of the household, the servant side and the family side, as well as tear down the pot's kitchen. He built an extension, which I'm currently sitting in, um, to the back of the house um, and put a two-story porch. So this kitchen that you see here was built in the 1940s. And it's considered essentially a little bit in a historical context because this was built by um, G. Edwin Brumbaugh, which um, if you're familiar with kind of Pennsylvania history, Pennsylvania architecture, um, Brumbaugh was kind of the leader of conservation, preservation, restoration uh, in the late 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s here in Pennsylvania. Um, so we are a Brumbaugh restoration and Brumbaugh built this um, in the 1940s for us. It's a fantastic uh, representation of what a wealthy 18th century kitchen would have looked like. Um, it is extremely a lot of fun to cook in. Um, like I said, if you visit our Facebook page, you will see me talking to a camera um, for quite a bit in the last year um, inside of our kitchen. We did cook um, in October this past year, um, a full three course 18th century meal in this kitchen over the course of one day um, back in October. So that is on our Facebook. But a lot of the biggest differences that you're going to see here in the Potts kitchen that you wouldn't see in a normal 18th century kitchen is number one, the staffing. Um, there was a paid cook. Um, it could have been a male, could have been a female. We do not have any cooks listed on our ledgers. 
which means that it could have been enslaved or indentured cook that was uh, working here in the household. Um, we do not have great records on either um, the uh, indentured or enslaved persons. Um, so that could be the case, but there was definitely a staff here. Um, outside of that, they would have had kind of an undercook um, or other servants uh, working in here to kind of help them throughout the day. Three meals were typically served here in the 18th century. Um, breakfast, just like you would today. Um, the main meal was served about one to two o'clock in the afternoon um, here in the household. And that would be kind of that more formal meal, um, typically that kind of three course meal um, that would be sit down, especially if there was guests in the household. And then dinner, um, it all depended on what was happening. If you were entertaining, it was another kind of more formal meal. Um, if not, it was typically leftovers and that was because your cook was paid um, so that they could kind of move on or if they were indentured or enslaved, um, they could go do other tasks for the day. Um, plus, uh, if you haven't tried to cook when it's completely dark in your kitchen by candlelight, um, you, you might hurt yourself a little bit. So um, they tried to do as much as they possibly could during the day um, to kind of have an ease on that aspect also. Um, Signs of wealth in our kitchen still exist that we like to show. Um, you notice here, this barrel, I don't know how hard this is, but get closer. Okay. you'll see oranges. Um, oranges were coming, any citrus was coming from the Mediterranean at the time, um, typically in the ports of Seville in Spain. Um, so they were packaged in barrels of sand or sawdust um, to help stay fresh um, to a point um, along the journey, they really understood, um, you know, for years and years and years, we were, we were told that, you know, our ancestors, you know, were up with the sun and, and all that type of stuff. And they were just a lot more than, you know, kind of honky tonky farmers. Um, they really understood science that you see massive science developments in the 18th century. And one of the things they understood with this is they knew that if a piece of fruit rots and it touches another piece of fruit, it's going to make that Piece of fruit rot also by separating everything it helps kind of keep things fresher and if you do have any rot it's not going to affect the rest of your um transport um that you have going the other signs of wealth here in the kitchen are things like white sugar so white sugar was coming from the caribbean typical sugar in the 18th century was called muscovado sugar um, you can still find it today the easiest way to kind of explain that is if you go to the grocery store and you buy a jar of molasses and a jar of brown sugar, and while you're carrying the bag, the bag breaks and shatters, the result is kind of like muscovado sugar. It's a bittery, molassesy sugar. Um, so white sugar, on the other hand, was coming from the Caribbean. Um, you were judged off the whiteness of your sugar, so that's why it's wrapped in brown in blue paper. Um, it came in cones because that's how it was dried. And then you would use sugar nips to nip at it. Um, and cut it off in the 18th century, especially in the household here, like the Potts family, they would even take the sugar and carve it into beautiful centerpieces and things like that for different dinners and parties and everything. So white sugar will play a major part. Heading back into here, we are now entering into John's office. Um, you know, this is what made John, John. Without this aspect of his life, nothing else in this house would have existed. John had to wealth because he was an extremely smart businessman. When you don't give your children anything, they had to buy it from you. Um, that you know shows the type of business person that John was running. John had many clerks. He had clerks at every single um, location that had money coming in or out or goods coming in or out. Um, that would include every single forge, every single furnace, the household here, um, his household in Philadelphia, uh, all of his merchant business in Philadelphia, as well as the stores and certain locations here at uh, the town of Potts Grove, which we'll talk a little bit here in a second. Um, so this business aspect is gonna be a major important thing. Now, this was never John's office. Um, we are in the middle of an HSR, which is a historic structures report um, being done here in the household. Um, that report is, our main question is, we want to know exactly what our structure looked like in, say, like 1760, while the Potts family was living here. We seem to think this is the downstairs workspace for the servants and enslaved area, because these stairs will lead you into that servants and enslaved area. Uh, when they made this John's office um, during the second restoration, they said that they would just close this door and shackle it each night um, so that people can come out. And we know that's not true. That is, that's um, kind of contrary to how things worked in the 18th century. Um, we do know that also 
on this wall, there's a beehive oven and a hearth that's inside of this wall. Um, so there, there was a kitchen in this room. Um, but the biggest telling reason of why this was never John's office is because John didn't spend enough time here. Um, he spent uh, the majority of his time in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, so, and we also have a couple of our iron pieces. Um, the five plate stove or jam stove that's here, um, that is a reproduction, um, but this is the original stove plate um, from Colebrookdale. This one here is an original from Warwick and another original from Warwick. Um, and we do change out our stove plates from time to time so that you can kind of see all the different ones that we have in our collection. Hang up the stairs here. These winding staircases get kind of weird on the 360 scan to move you around. Um, and hopefully I'm not making anybody seasick by doing this. I apologize if I am. Um, but in here, this is our servants and enslaved workroom. Um, this is on the second floor of the household, um, opposite from the family bedrooms on the family side. Um, what's really interesting about this room is uh, when you get down to the base paint layer in the household here, uh, there's burn marks along the entire chair rail. Um, so what we know is that work was being done here all throughout the, the night. Uh, work was being done almost on a 24 hour, seven day basis. And that's kind of two things. Number one, it, it took a lot of work to upkeep a house of this size in the 18th century. And the amount of people you gotta think, it's not just the Potts family, but it's the servants and enslaved persons also living and working inside this house. Uh, but on top of that, the Potts family didn't want to see a lot of things either. Um, so polishing, cleaning, things like that are going to be done while they're sleeping overnight. Um, so there was the need to um, use lighting and you would put it up against the wall because the wall helped reflect light back into the room in the 18th century. Um, so think of it kind of as a mirror. Um, but this is a workroom. This is where I also introduced kind of what servitude looked like in the household. There was three classes and three classifications. Um, the three classes were high class, middling class, and low class. Um, and the three classifications were paid or contracted, uh, indentured, and enslaved. And down here, I'm going to talk about that kind of paid and contracted. About 1760, John establishes the town of Potts Grove, which is now the town of Potts Town. And by 1761, we've seen a lot of people flock to live here um, early on. And the majority of those people are uh, considered paid or contracted employees of well, essentially what I call is Potts and Co, uh, but this empire that John has created by 1760. And those paid workers, those contracted workers are coming here um, to work for the Potts family. They work sometimes kind of almost on a salary position. Um, other times they're working for just a few weeks, but just wanna be around kind of the Potts um, companies that are happening here. Um, there's also a store here. Um, so you can have goods readily available for you as well as there was inns and taverns and breweries and tanneries. So there was a lot happening here in the 1760s. And John was smart. He didn't look at this as starting a town. He really looked at this as starting a company town. And the reason behind that is number one, all of these paid and contracted persons that are flocking here to work for John were purchasing lots here in Potts Grove. They were round renting lots here in Potts Grove. So John did not allow the purchasing of lots until closer to his death in 1767. So from roughly 1761 until then, everybody that was working for John was then turning around and paying to live here also. Um, so that's you know really, really important. So even though we call them paid and we call them contracted, number one, very, very few of them are salaried. In fact, um, really, there's one woman that we see, and she is definitely a household-based servant who's working for nine years for the family. Um, everybody else is kind of contracts, monthly contracts, um, weekly contracts, even daily contracts um, of short amounts of things, making shoes, providing provisions, mending, sewing, things like that. Um, but they're all living in this newly established community that John has put up. They're also purchasing from the store, which is being sourced from John's store in Philadelphia. But the difference is he's priced it up 30% from his stores here in Philadelphia. Um, so again, he's kind of creating this company town that's not only helping his company grow, but it's also fueling a little bit more money back into his company by having these people who are working for him. 
When you look at the ledgers, a lot of these contracted paid employees are not actually receiving any type of money from John. They're either closing out um, kind of completely even from where they were uh, at the start of the month, you know, once you take, you know, wages out and then add in the bills from the store and things like that, um, or they're turning around and having to pay money into um, the store because they overused the money and didn't make enough working for John for that, uh, for that time. Um, so it's a very, very interesting thing. So even though we use paid contracted, we use it kind of um, on a very um, loose basis. And now head up one more flight. I'll talk about um, some of these other that are living and working here. So now you're on the third floor of the manor house here. Um, up here, you are looking at um, servants and enslaved sleeping quarters. So outside of the paid and indentured servants, we also are paid and contracted servants. We also had indentured servants and enslaved servants of the household. Indentured servants was a contract that they uh, went into for John. Um, an indenture in the 18th century really meant anytime you owed a debt to John. Uh, but for the most part, it was really for passage from their uh, native country here to Pennsylvania that John would have paid for. And again, when we look at John, he's running this business mind. The reason we don't see a ton of paid salary workers is because John is using the indentured servants and the enslaved servants as a way to get free labor um, instead of having to pay somebody for it. So the majority of our indentured servants, the majority of our enslaved servants are gonna have higher class jobs and very extremely skilled jobs. Because if not, if you had to go out into the regular community, he would be paying a pretty high overhead cost, especially when it came to the forges and the furnaces, which were really ran on enslaved and indentured power in the 18th century. But the indentures, um, essentially, it, it was kind of like, if you're familiar with like a modern day dating app, um, they would put an ad into a newspaper, kind of tell them a little bit about themselves. John could learn about it, or John could vice, vice versa, put an ad out saying what he's looking for. Um, essentially, they would make a binding contract. John would pay for um, either that person or that person and their family to come here to Pottsgrove. Um, and then for the next seven to 10 years, uh, they would work uh, their contract off. Um, and then at the end of that, John typically did give them freedom dues, um, anywhere between three to five pounds sterling silver, which was a lot of money um, they were given. Um, and then they kind of went on about their ways. Um, a lot of our indentured servants are males. Um, and most of them are coming from uh, the Netherlands. So they're Dutch. Uh, we also see some Irish, but again, they're very skilled labor. Um, just in that runaway ad for the beginning, um, you saw a carpenter, you saw a blacksmith. Um, so these are you know, gentlemen who are doing jobs in the 18th century that if they were not indentured would have been receiving a decent wage while working for the Potts family. The uh, enslaved servants of the household, there was 13, there was 10 males and three females. Margaret, Nancy and Flora were definitely working in the household. They were working with uh, Mrs. Potts directly. Two of the three uh, female enslaved, Margaret and Nancy, are gonna actually move on with Ruth Potts um, after John's death. Um, so they're definitely, you know, of the higher class, they're definitely working with Ruth on a daily basis and providing for the care um, throughout the house that Ruth would expect. The 10 males, we do not know as much about their life as the females, but one thing that we do know is they were certainly jacks of all trade. They did a little bit of everything. They were doing high class dinners. They were running errands for John. They were driving um, teams um, back and forth to Philadelphia. They were making new fences. They were helping, you know, harvest in the fields. They did a little bit of everything in the 18th century, um, which is a little bit different than, you know, what our modern mindset at times thinks of enslaved persons um, in history. Uh, but they definitely uh, were still doing a whole lot. Um, there was a whole lot asked of them, um, but they were definitely doing more than just kind of working in the fields. Um, they were definitely doing a little bit of everything. Uh, for the household here in the 18th century. So we're gonna transition now. I'm gonna take you back over to the family side of the household. Um, this wall here now has a doorway. Daniel Hittner put this in. 
Um, but during the 18th century, this would have been a solid wall separating the two sides of the household from the family side and the servants and slave side. Coming back through, this is our blue room. Third floor up here, the nursery for the family was. And then coming down the stairs, we're getting into the family's bed chambers. We're almost done, so you can ask as many questions as you like here in a second. So it's three bedrooms um, in the 18th century. This back portion here, uh, which is our exhibit room, uh, which we're hopefully getting ready to open up here um, in the next few months. Uh, that was a kind of either a children's bedchamber, uh, but probably most of the time because there wasn't a lot of children in the household, it was typically a transient bedchamber. Uh, we do know that the Potts, um, their family would come to visit and stay in a transient bedchamber. Um, up here, we have, um, that's Ruth, by the way, that is John's wife. Um, she is a widow. She is definitely a grandmother. So 13 children, 74 grandchildren, over 200 great grandchildren. Um, but there is no known portraits of John. Uh, we're not too sure. That is Jonathan, the doctor that I talked about. Uh, we just recently, we were going to do an exhibit on Jonathan last year. It was going to be one of the largest exhibits we've done here in, in recent years. Um, and of course, because um, he dedicated his life to infectious disease, it would take an infectious disease to cancel the exhibit for Jonathan to do. Um, so now we have a massive portrait of him in the household. Uh, but that is the portrait of Jonathan, the doctor of the house. In the master bed chamber here, this is the room of John and Ruth. Uh, this is also the room that John will pass away in on June 6th, uh, 1768. Um, he passed from what they called was a long and tedious illness. We're not too sure what it was, but um, it did. Uh, he suffered from it for about nine months. Um, if I had to take an educated guess, because um, everybody will always ask me, um, probably cancer, something like that. Um, he definitely, definitely struggled uh, later on in life. Um, but here uh, we talk about kind of after John's death, uh, what type of legacy did John leave? And the first one being that um, his children, uh, especially the boys, continued the name and they continued the name really, really well. You know, John really set the foundation for the Potts name and to the iron and essentially metal industry here in 18th century Pennsylvania. And it's his children who really kind of take, you know, take the reins and, and run with it um, after his death. Um, Thomas is running Coventry. Samuel will eventually run Warwick during the war. Um, and his children, especially the boys, um, are really, really going to be taking on all these different business adventures, expanding the Potts empire, expanding the Potts name um, to kind of what you see in the history that we follow today. You know, Pottstown, you know, was built on industry that John really took kind of, you know, a leap to establish here, took a leap to establish the town, but that town fueled immigration, that town fueled industry, and it really, really succeeded all the way up until really industry left in the 1970s and the 1980s here in Pottstown. So it kind of shows you the impact that the Potts family had on the local community and the local area. Interesting note, as we transition here, this is the only room they purchased curtains for. So I'm not sure. They had interior shutters in uh, most of the upstairs bedrooms, but this one, they had curtains. Um, so I guess they really enjoyed their privacy. Moving across, we have, um, I'll let you peek in the closet here. We do have a walk-in closet here at Pottsgrove Manor, which is really neat. Um, clothes would be hung up to air out and dry out inside the closet here. And then our children's bedchamber, uh, which is always a favorite. Um, and this is where we talk about the, the girls of the household the, um, and kind of their legacy after um, their father's death in 1768. Uh, the girls are really where you kind of get to see the children's story really unfold. So there's a, a very clear divide between the oldest and the youngest children of the Potts family. The oldest children kind of follow the straight and narrow. Um, the boys get involved in the, in the iron industry. If they don't follow in the iron industry, they study and become deeper into something and then return back to the iron industry. And then starting with Jonathan, who becomes really the doctor, you see that shift change. On the girls aspect of that, the older daughters are marrying rich and they're marrying closely related. They're keeping the names very close. They're marrying rudders. They're marrying savages. They're marrying, or 
um, nuts. They're, they're all staying relatively inside the same family to the point that the dowry chest that you see here, which was owned by Anna Potts, um, she marries her first cousin, David Potts, um, in, at Christmas time of 1768. Um, after Jonathan, the, the younger daughters kind of have a different lifestyle. A lot of times they don't get married um, until relatively later in life. They marry down a class. Um, so it's really, really interesting. Perhaps the most important aspect of the girls of the household is how closely knit they kept the family. They really, really, really hold on to the family and hold on to the family name. A lot of the older daughters are going to care for the younger children after John's death. Ruth kind of um, goes on and lives her life a little bit after John passes. Um, and so the ch care of the younger children uh, kind of went on the older girls of the household. Um, the other interesting aspect that we see is that um, a lot of the boys of the house pass early. Um, they pass at a younger age also, much like their father. So it may have been something hereditary. Um, but uh, what we see, uh, you know, is that the family quickly groups together at the death of each of these gentlemen and not only accepts their children in, but their widow also and cares for them and takes care of them and kind of keeps it very, very close. Um, so, you know, we start with this story where John is kind of, you know, providing for his family kind of in a, you know, way that is from an outside looking in perspective, uh, where, where we end with the children are very, very close knit. They're very working very closely together. Um, and they're kind of keeping and supporting each other at that time. And that brings us to the end. We'll go back down because I just think the, the view into the Great Hall from the front door here um, is a good place to kind of stand. You can see High Street. Um, and I can I answer any questions that anybody might have. I do here. The first one is about the boundaries of Pottstown. So like how, if it started out being called Potts Grove and then turned into Pottstown, how is the actual like Potts Grove area involved in all of that? Yeah, so, so essentially it's all Potts Grove. Um, so it gets settled as Potts, it actually gets settled as Pottsylvania. Um, so the family moved here in July of 1752 um, and they call Pottsylvania for a little bit over a month before they do change the name to Potts Grove. Um, so it's Potts Grove, and then we quickly begin to see references of what they're calling Potts Town or Potts's Town, starting as early as 1763, but it really isn't until the borough is established in 1813 that the official name changes. Um, so all this area changes to, um, to Potts Town. And then Stowe, Stowe plays a big part. Stowe originates its name out of the Potts family. Stowe was the name of the plantation that John Jr. established here in 1771. Um, eventually that will become Stowe the town. Um, and then later on, it kind of gets broken up where you have your lower Potts Grove, your West Potts Grove. But essentially kind of all of that land that makes up um, all of Potts Town, all of Stowe, um, all of the you know, Potts Grove's to a point, Lower Potts Grove is a little bit different. That kind of stretches a little bit outside of his uh, footholding. Um, is all of the original land acreage, I mean, 995 early on, by the time of his death, I believe it's just under 1300 acres um, is completely of kind of what's being divvied up here from his estate. Mm -hmm. It's extremely confusing even for us, um, <laughs> you know. They, they, re they reference it in the same breath as Potts Grove, the town, Potts Grove, the house, and then Potts Town, all in the same like document. And you're like, which Potts Grove is Potts Grove and what are we trying to do here? So. <laughs> and Pottsylvania, Pennsylvania is such a mouthful. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're very, very happy that changed pretty quickly. <laughs> um, do you have any information on like John's personality, like did, was he a generally likable person or um, do we know anything about, you know, his behavior? No, we, we really don't, uh, we would love to. Um, that's probably the one thing that we wish, we, you know, was, was he a likable person? We know that about Jonathan, the doctor, uh, you know, he, he's a pretty famous doctor, especially during the American Revolution. Um, and when anybody talks about Jonathan in, in the 18th century, 
they talk about how he was awesome. I mean, they just, they talk about his personality, the person that he was, his character. Um, it's, it's all right there. You know, he had people who were in massive feuds with each other. Jonathan was like the peacekeeper. He, you know, he was able to kind of bring them together at the same table to achieve, you know, common footholds. We don't see that with John. Um, what we see with John a little bit more is a little bit more of his thought, his ideology. We see it with how he kind of approached business. Mm-hmm. Um, we also see it with kind of what he thought as far as science. Um, it, we believe that he was a supporter of John Locke. Um, there was a bust of John Locke on the Potts desk. Um, mm-hmm. There was also reference that when he served on the assembly, he served that in the assembly out of Philadelphia County and Berks County. And essentially, you know, today, if we had to give a name to it in a modern sense, he served on the Franklin ticket. Um, and Franklin was a big believer in science. Um, that's why we know John also wasn't a massive practicing Quaker, um, as some people will tell you that he, he was, is because Franklin wasn't a big supporter of the Quaker uh, religion. Um, so uh, especially when John is getting sick, um, Franklin writes a letter about how they need to get a like-minded uh, fellow to John Potts and things like that. But if he was funny or if he you know, was grumpy, we, have, we don't know. Um, there isn't enough um, documentation that kind of talks about um, his personality. Enough. Maybe one day we'll find those letters. <laughs> that would be fantastic. If you do, send them over. <laughs> We'd love to see them. And you did answer another question too while you answered that one about um, why was Jonathan your favorite? So I think uh, you could even hear it the way you were talking about it, how kind he was. And Yeah. You know, it, and it's more than that. Um, he, he has a really interesting story. So he goes to boarding school. Um, he grows up with his best friend and cousin, Benjamin Rush. Um, if anybody is familiar with that name, a uh, very famous doctor in the 18th century. Um, they both, um, once graduated boarding school, go and apprentice in an apothecary. And it's that apothecary that urges both of them to go to medical school. So it's actually Jonathan who uses the family's connection to Ben Franklin that allows Rush and Potts to uh, go to a medical school at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which was the leading English speaking medical school at the time. Four months into after arriving and studying, starting his studies there, uh, he was greeted with the uh, news that his fiance at home was pregnant with his child. Um, which wasn't uncommon in the 18th century. The problem is he's halfway across the world now. Um, so normally they would just quickly get married and nobody would think twice about it. Um, but in his case, uh, he just has this like series of unfortunate events that occurs. He doesn't show up here until after his first child is born. Um, and, and he's really, he's faced with this kind of, I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to do with my life now. You know, he, the iron industry, I don't think was really a calling that Jonathan wanted to have. Um, but the wealth of his father allowed him to be able to go back to medical school. He went to um, school in, in Philadelphia for medicine, which was the first med- medical school here in North America, where he'll eventually graduate as the valedictorian. Um, so he gets he receives literally the first medical degree here in, in North America. Um, and then he goes on and just has, um, you know, success in Reading. Uh, and then a smallpox breaks out. So he just kind of, he's faced with that adversity, but he just powers through adversity each time. I think it's a, it just, you know, the story of his life is just a really neat story that just kind of comes about facing adversity head on and kind of just forging your own way through it. That's a great answer. Yeah. In the kitchen, there was a wire connected to the ceiling over to the cooking area. Yep. What's the purpose of that? Yeah, it's rotisserie. Um, so let me get into there. So it's called a clock jack. Um, there, you don't see them too often anymore. If you go to Williamsburg, don't let Williamsburg fool you. It is a reproduction. Um, ours is original. Um, not that that matters, but sometimes it does. Um, but yeah, so it's not set up here, but um, essentially this rope that's kind of hanging out here would run down to a spit. Let me see if I can get the spits under the table here. So let me see if I can get a, find a good angle. Let's take a look. Yeah, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I can. but just think of like a large rotisserie spit that you see at like Boston Market or Giant. Um, and essentially that rope connects into it. There is a weight up here. That weight is counterbalanced off the spit and the protein that's being ran. 
And then this weight pulls down like the weight of a clock does, and it drives this mechanism. And essentially you're trying to take uh, what they call is horizontal power and drive it, drive it into vertical power. It's just using simple machinery, uh, very similar to the inner workings of a clock is. So it's called a clock jack. It is pretty awesome. Um, we use it quite a bit here at the household. Um, recently for Mayfair, we did uh, a side of pork um, on it. It takes, once, it, once that weight drops down, <clears throat> you have to wind it back up again. Um, so um, depending on the size of your protein, um, if you time it out, it actually works as a kitchen timer also. Um, so once you set that and it starts going, um, you time out the first couple of times, we were running 18 minutes. Um, so it's how you know your other dishes, how they're cooking, how long it's taking. Also, once you go from 18 minutes to like 10 minutes, every time, little time every 10 minutes, you drive it back up again, um, you know your pork is done. Um, you know, it, it's getting to the, to the end. Um, so yeah, it's like the coolest tool in the house probably. Um, I'm sure we all have our favorites, but this is one of my favorites. <laughs> that was a cool aqua. We didn't even see it until we came back over. And let's see, after mentioning that children were cared for by a wet nurse, it seems odd that there was a cradle at the foot of the bed in the Potts' bedroom. Um, what was that for? Yeah, uh, what's really interesting is we don't see a wet nurse for every single child. Um, so sometimes we see a wet nurse, sometimes we don't see a wet nurse. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't a wet nurse there. Again, that wet nurse could have been enslaved. It could have been entered. Um, but we just, we don't always, so sometimes we use that aspect as a talking point um, because we do, we do see a different connection with their children, especially Ruth with their children um, at times um, on how they're raising them and things like that. So um, we, we try to kind of bring as many different stories into the house um, as we can. Um, so we believe that possibly Ruth would have um, nursed some of her children, uh, but not all of her children as there are wet nurses that appear. Or the other aspect of it is Ruth could have, um, because she was traveling, she traveled quite a bit um, also, uh, that we see a wet nurse sometimes because either Ruth was only available for certain times of the day, um, or she was traveling and they needed a wet nurse um, while she was traveling. Gotcha. Um, when and why were the acres sold off? Yeah, so um, that's the million dollar question around Potts Growth Manor right now. Um, so it's kind of like a 10 year span. Um, so in 1767, as John is getting ill, uh, he, begins, he begins splitting up his land. And one of the first things he does is he separates what is now the today the town of Pottstown from the property here. Uh, but again, he's a smart businessman and he ran his property line 10 foot on the opposite bank of the Manitoni so that he re retained all of the water rights of the property here um, instead of giving it to the town. That doesn't change for a hundred years um, after, but yeah, so he's, he begins to separate portions of the town that becomes, um, Part of it becomes large parcels that people purchase and then charge ground rent for themselves. Portions of it become areas that people can purchase. Uh, all of that will change almost on a yearly basis from 1767 until about seven, mid 1770s. Um, there is portions that are just large um, acreage of land um, that, are, that are portioned out and sold um, as part of the estate. Um, essentially here, what is the house gets, um, whittled down to about 490 acres. We, we say 500, uh, but really I think it's closer to 490. Um, and that gets put into, from the estate, it, it's given first rights of refusal to Tommy, the oldest, uh, which he does purchase it. And then eventually he sells 250 acres, um, of the plantation to his brother, John Jr., who then establishes Stowe. Um, so that's kind of how all the land gets divvied up, um, but it, it's not kind of all at the same time. We, you can track uh, a larger parcel of land from 1769 and see it in 1770 being split back up again. 
Um, so it does change year to year. Um, but right now, what we're trying to do is map out these acreage um, that's being sold, um, not only so that we kind of know all the different parcels and map it out, but what's really great is as it's being sold, the descriptions are fantastic. Um, so we're trying to take those descriptions and paint a picture of what the surrounding area around the house would have looked like um, at the time of John's death. Okay. Um, did all of their children who were born survive into adulthood? They did. Yep. The youngest would be 36. That'd be Jonathan when he passed. He passed at the age of 36. Wow, they were very lucky. Uh, why is the family buried next to a house on Chestnut Street and not buried at their manor house or in a churchyard? Yeah, it, in the 18th century, it wasn't customary. That was all of a, kind of an open area. There was also um, a churchyard there. So where the Potts family burial grounds are today, um, the parking lot that's directly behind it off of King Street was a Quaker meeting, um, as well as they had the schoolhouse there and things like that. So you're beginning to look a little outside of town, uh, which was pretty common. It's the same thing in Philadelphia. A lot of the 18th century cemeteries in Philadelphia are now in populous areas of Philadelphia. It's because originally it was kind of outside of town. And then the city just kind of expanded out and around those areas. Um, very similar area here, uh, but it is kind of odd that we're of its location now. But yeah, in the 18th century, um, it was kind of a quiet area, but it was also uh, near the Lutheran Church, near the Quaker meeting at the school that was established here. Okay. Um, did they have any beloved pets that you know of? They had a dog. They purchased a dog, uh, I believe in 1753. Um, they purchased a dog for the household. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And let's see. Um, I have one more question that is relevant to the manor, and then I've got another one that's relevant to the area-ish. So um, when was is the manor open to the public? Yeah. Um, so, what's the cost? Yeah, so let me, let me go... I'll go back because I'll put it up because we just changed all of our our times and everything like that. Um, maybe. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Yeah. Anyway, we are open. Um, oh, coming. Pieces. Uh, so we're open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, tours are at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, and 3. Um, Sunday, they are at 1, 2, and 3. So we're essentially open from 10 to 4, Tuesday through Saturday, and Sunday, 1 to 4. Um, right now, we are still, um, if you would like to make a reservation, we would love to have you make a reservation. Um, as a staff, even though we are all fully vaccinated, um, we're still in a very social distance uh, work environment. Um, so it just helps us be able to plan um, our staffing. Um, and you can make reservations at potsgrovemanor.eventbrite.com at any time. Um, these new hours will start on Tuesday, um, the 8th, um, just for anybody who might be jumping on there. Um, so we uh, are a free site. Uh, all we ask is a suggested $2 donation per person um, for a tour. Um, but we would love to have you. We are open. We are offering our, our next program is a virtual program, and that's next uh, Saturday, the 12th um, at 11 a.m., where we're going to be talking about the community surrounding Potts Grove um, in, the, in the 1760s uh, and the impact of um, the Potts family into the community and kind of the, how, what the community looked like and things like that. Um, and then we have some live summer programming um, in July. Um, keep an eye on our webpage on the county site, um, as well as our, uh, if you're, if anybody does it, Instagram and Facebook. Um, it has all of our information on there. You can also shoot me an email, give me a phone call. Um, I love to talk um, all things POTS, so, or just history in general. Um, so feel free to shoot me uh, an email or a phone call with any questions you might have. Great. And then on uh, the Facebook page? Sorry, what was that? The program that you have coming up about the community that's on the Facebook page? Yeah, it'll be on our Facebook. It'll be streamed on our Facebook page. Yep. Terrific. Um, I did have a question come in towards the beginning uh, that you may or may not know. When you had that first map pulled up that was from 
long ago. Yeah. Um, the town of Limerick had two M's in it. Do you happen to know when that was changed and or why? I do not know. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, an interesting least. question though if you figure it is out. <laughs> yeah it, it is um you know maps maps are one of the easiest things to kind of find today um so what you could do is kind of start with the you know start with like an 1897 map um kind of late victorian map uh, where it probably is normal limerick as we know it today um and then begin to work your way back um library of congress is a really good place to kind of do that search um, so at some point you should be able to see it. It can also be, that's what the map maker wanted to spell it at the time. And it was actually never spelled with two M's. Um, in John's marriage certificate, if I went back, whoever wrote his marriage certificate wrote his name wrong. Um, so stuff like that occurred all the time. I can't imagine having my own marriage certificate misspelled today, uh, but there's a couple misspellings in that marriage certificate um, that we have. So. So yeah, so that's that's definitely not out of the you know ordinary for the 18th century. <laughs> I did have a couple more questions come through. Uh, did the women in the family inherit property or money, or did all of it just go directly to their husbands? I know you mentioned that some of it went to the husbands at least. Yeah, so so I guess it all depends on what child it was directly. Um, you know, Ruth she inherited quite a bit from John's estate. Um, she was very, very well taken care of. Um, once 1779 hits and the estate gets closed out, um, any of those daughters who are single receive all that money. Um, you know, the 18th century was a little different than what we give them credit for. You know, it's really the Victorian time period. And, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to try to hate on the Victorian time period too much. Uh, but the Victorian time period kind of takes us backwards more than it takes us forward. Um, you know, Anna Nutt, who you know is directly related into this family you know is helping to establish warwick furnace and running warwick furnace i mean she's essentially an iron woman or iron mistress as they would refer to um at the time so you know women definitely did not have the rights that um you know that sh they should have had um but there was there was actually more freedom of ownership um, in the 18th century than say 100 years later as you enter into the Victorian time period. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it looks like my last question at this moment is um, how did you yourself get to be a historian and wind up at Potts Grove? Yeah, um, great question. So I grew up around the field. Um, at a very young age, I was introduced to living history. Uh, my father was a history teacher. So I got involved in living history through my father um, about the age of three, I believe. Um, and I just kind of grew up around it, um, graduated from high school, went into the military. Um, and it was definitely during the military that um, I was asked a project um, to do to talk about um, a Marine Corps unit at Bella Wood um, that I'd been serving in. And that really kind of, I found a lot of um, peace by doing it. And that's kind of where I decided to go in life. Um, I'll tell you, it's an extremely hard job field to work in. Um, so to just break into it. So I did coach soccer for a number of years of all things, uh, but eventually I was finally able to kind of break in part-time and just work my way up. Um, and I absolutely love it. Um, you know, this is my job. It's also a big hobby of mine. Um, I'm a big, I am still am a living his historian, um, all World War I and World War II now. Um, so it is a big passion. It's a big love of mine. Um, Potts Grove Manor, um, you know, all of my um, parts of my professional studies is early American kind of focused in the colonies up until like reconstruction in the American Civil War. Um, I've always been really interested in material culture and industry. Um, I worked at a grist mill site um, prior to coming here. Um, and then uh, I was just very fortunate that this job opened um, at a time that I was looking to kind of continue my path in life um, and was able to make it here and, and love it here. Uh, I'll probably retire from here. Um, this is kind of my, my forever job at this point. Um, the county takes extremely, extremely good care of its employees as well as its historic sites. Um, so we are in a very, very um, different and very fortunate situation that that we are here. Um, 
So I, I love it here and I'm very, you know, very happy with where my career has taken me. That's great. If anybody, if anybody ever wants to talk British World War One or World War Two, you know, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a phone call because uh, I'll talk your ear off even more. That's great. And it's so nice to hear how well the county takes care of their historic sites and you guys. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, a few more questions are coming in. Keep sure. coming in, guys. This is great. Um, did Mr. Potts free his enslaved people after his death, or did another family member? Yeah, so um, so passing in 1768, sorry, I wanted to turn that light back. Um, passing in 1768, uh, emancipation of enslaved persons still uh, really wasn't contemplated. Um, not to get too deep into it, but if you look at uh, Pennsylvania enslaved law in the 18th century, um, it actually, the way that it's written, essentially, even after emancipation, um, the slave owner still, re still has responsibility to the enslaved person. Um, so if that enslaved person was, who was then given their freedom went out and raised the debt, it could come back on its former master. Um, if they did a heinous crime, it could come back on its former master. Um, so really the slave law the, in the 18th century didn't make it um, you know, suitable for somebody. That's gonna quickly change. The American Revolution changes everything. And by the end of the American Revolution, emancipation becomes a part of Pennsylvania, um, even though it's a generational thing, but um, you see kind of a mix of it. But John does not, um, all of his enslaved persons are either distributed amongst family, uh, amongst his wife receives two of the three female enslaved persons, um, or they're sold off. Um, so yeah, as far as we know, none of them are, um, you know, given their freedom. Now, we do know Hercules is one of the enslaved persons who decides to self-emancipate himself. Um, he runs away um, in 1750. Seven, I believe it is, uh, from John Potts. He um, is found and is actually, we just found out, is sold to William Byrd um, of the, the Hopewell area, um, where then he turns around and runs away again. Um, and we believe he, he, did, he did free himself at that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any of the Potts family still alive today? Yeah, there, there's um, tons of them, and they're all over the country. Uh, we have, we still have many Potts family members local. Uh, in fact, I'm surprised, and we might, I, I don't see all the names, but we, it's every once in a while we do have Potts family members that that um, that are still local and attend um, functions like this. They probably heard me speak enough over the last year, um, so I don't blame them for not being here. Um, but we also have them all throughout the country. We see them in Texas and California. Um, so there, there are uh, quite a few Potts descendants um, still with us to, the, to this day. Well, with over two great grandchildren, I'm not surprised. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that was my last question that came through at this moment. Um, I am gonna let you guys unmute yourselves at this point if you have anything else you'd like to say. Mila, I'm getting a lot of thank yous. Thank you. Uh, many people found it very interesting. I enjoyed it. More thank yous are rolling in. Um, all right, I'm going to make this last call then. Thank you. Very well done. Thumbs ups. All right, well, thank you, Neil. Uh, oh, thank you all so much. Yeah, that was a great night, and um, you were a terrific presenter. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. And again, if you think of anything else, there's my contact information. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Email is probably the best way to get a hold. That is the office line. Uh, so I'm not always in, but um, I'm definitely always by my email. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Have a nice night. Kelly, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, Neil. This was very, very interesting. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Good night. Good night. Have a great night.